coming up, an interview with one of the frontline pioneers of new wave music on one of the strangest and most compelling recordings of the era. It changed everything and it lured us into a new decade with wonder. Stories coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. If you wanna go behind uh, the songs of our times, the great ones with the actual creators, make sure to subscribe below and click the bell so that you never miss out. And do take a second to look at our Patreon and our new merch. This is my little parody, little tip of the hat to Devo there. And that helps us keep the channel going. So it's time for another edition of our series, Revelations, where great artists take us on a deep dive into their greatest songs and their greatest albums. A few months ago, we took a fascinating journey into the 80s classic, Whip It, with Devo's Jerry Casale. Jerry is such an interesting and entertaining artist, really brilliant guy who pioneered, helped to pioneer the new wave sound. Well, today we have a special video behind the exhilarating performance that leveled American audiences when Devo played Saturday Night Live. That was a great moment. Jerry also tells us the origin of their signature red domes and what Devo really means, plus more intel on his latest project. It's one of the most interesting interviews that I've ever done. And there are a few surprises in here that you're gonna love, so let's get right into it. Now, as we go into this interview, I do wanna thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, my favorite eyewear company. At zenny.com, you can design your own glasses, the style, the color, the shape, and then you actually get to see what you look like. Try it on virtually before you buy it. You put in your prescription and they deliver them right to your door. Check it out today at zenny.com. Here's Jerry. The crazy cover of the Rolling Stones, I can't get no satisfaction that you put on the EP. The memories that stands out to me as a kid that just was like an uppercut, a roundhouse kick to the senses when I saw you on Saturday Night Live. What is this? This is, I just, my, my ears, I would hear radio as I was in the car, you know, when my, my parents were driving along and I'd hear the stuff from that time, Neil Diamond and Barbara Streisand and stuff like that. And this was was so foreign to me, and it was like sci-fi meets pop music. Yeah, well, that, that's a good that's a good explanation. That's what we were. And in, luckily, at that point in time, you know, we had just stayed in Akron in garages and basements and honed our act. And by the time we had played in the summer of '77, over and over and over in San Francisco and in L.A. in the surrounding areas and all the clubs. We were now fully formed. We were really good at performing. And so when we hit Saturday Night Live, luckily that night, even though we were hitting our pants, you know, and having never played in front of more than maybe 400 people, we were hitting our pants, but we kept it together and we played with such intensity, we got it together. So people did see what we wanted them to see. But it was so scary because Lauren Michaels came over in the dark, you know, with his assistant during the commercial break where everybody has to be set up. And we had rehearsed for the previous two days over and over. You pretend you're alive and you do your act three times a day so that they because they're they're honing the show down. Live from New York is Saturday night. They're throwing out skits. They're rearranging what comes where. So. He comes over in the dark, he goes, all right, you guys. And he's got a flashlight from his assistant on his face, so we can only see Lauren Michaels. So it's like a silly horror movie. <laughs> yeah. He goes, you're gonna hear Don Pardo's voice in about 10 seconds. With musical guest, Devo. When you ha hear him say, Devo, you just start playing. I don't care if no lights go on. I don't care if your amps don't work. You just go because there's 15 million people about to see this and don't screw up. And then the light goes out and they walk away. Yeah. And then you hear Don Pardo and then you're like, oh. Yeah. 
Why did you choose to do a Devo version of that classic rock standard? I've always been curious. Uh, because the Rolling Stones had been on the week before. So we thought, what's going to show everybody what Devo means? First, we have the name check song, Jocko Home. And our manager, Elliot Roberts, on my behalf, fought Lorne Michaels to be allowed for us to show a 15, no, about a 20 second intro from our 10 minute film, The Truth About De-Evolution, as our intro to Jocko Home. No one had ever been allowed to do that. They only showed their own film clips that they made. Uh, the, you know, the same guy that made Mr. Bill. They only showed his stuff. And so this was a first. So we, we had to do the name check song. That's pretty obvious. That's like a, a manifesto. But the other thing I thought was everybody, when they'd hear Satisfaction, they had a reference to traditional rock and roll because Satisfaction was one of the best rock and roll songs ever written, ever, and still to this day, ever written. No so it was like, well, once you hear Devo's version, it answers all your question about what's deep, like our approach to music. It answers your questions. It's like, it's a, it's, it's a, you know, proof of concept. It's like, here, this is what Devo means. You know the song, you know Satisfaction, now listen to Devo. And that'll, that'll answer everything. <laughs> That's why we did it. Just even, what you wore on stage and everything, every part of it, like you said, performance art, it just it just struck such a chord. I've seen pretty much till about 1995, I saw every musical performance ever on Saturday Night Live. And that's one of the top three, if not the number one that sticks with me. Not only because of the song, but because of the, the way you looked. Right, and, and that's again what Devo was all about, this multimedia concept. We, everything proceeded from ideas and from discussions. And, uh, you know, I had, I, I probably personally, like as the field marshal for Devo, I had this obsession with how we would uh, uh, um, interact with the audience and how we would look. And I wanted to get rid of everything arbitrary. This wasn't a band that was going to like stop and tune up and have an open beer on your amplifier and start drinking, meaningless banter with the audience, uh, and everybody trying to wear their coolest thing that they think makes them sexy. It was not about that. This was like a bigger idea than us as individuals. You know, it was more like the five musketeers, right? And I thought, well, personalities, of course, are going to emerge, just like they did with the Beatles. But that's not going to be the point of it point of is it's showing something that's a bigger idea and that's what's sexy and exciting about it so the choreography was on purpose the outfits were on purpose you know everything was tested and thought out but that's what that's what got us excited i mean that's why, what we, why we liked doing what we were doing and having fun. Well, around the time the band was putting out third studio album, Freedom of Choice, you created the Energy Dome, mistakenly referred to as the flower pot by so many. How did you invent the Energy Dome? Well, I've been working with this uh, seamstress uh, in the film business because I wanted silver suits. You know, we all talked about doing something that looked like early R&B album covers, right? But Devo, like robot versions of R&B. And so I was getting these silver suits fabricated for the band. And the only silver fabric she could find was this bar stool material. It was super hot. It was Naga hide. She brought it into the studio for us to look at, but everybody liked the look of it. And so we decided, even if we can't really wear this on stage, this fits the album cover idea. And then I just, I don't know, I, 
I decided it needed a hat because through the years, you know, we had talked about headgear, but never done anything about it. The only headgear we'd ever worn was that rector of skateboard stuff that they gave us. So that wasn't something we created. It was just, we put it on. And so I kept looking at the silver suits and thinking, what would, what would we wear on, t- on our heads that would be cool? And, you know, this is where there's that leap of faith. When I was in grade school, school was built in the 30s. And it was, you know, the teachers were all nuns and priests. And I hated it every day. I hated going there. But the school was all a lot of Art Deco fixtures and Art Deco uh, trim inside in the interior space. And I used to stare at these milk glass lamps that were in every room that were basically, well, here, I'm going to show you. Wow. This is, this is a fixture. It hung from the ceiling. Notice there's one, two, three, four, five tiers. It hung from the ceiling like this with a light bulb inside it, three chains hanging. I used to love looking at this. And this is a classic Art Deco uh, shape. It permeates a lot of design in the theory. And so I just, something came into my head about that because I never forgot this. And I thought, well, what if it's this way? And what if it's red? And what if it's only four tiers because that's the proportion that would fit a human head? And this became the red hat, vacuform plastic. And my good friend who had moved out from Ohio four years before us had started Modern Props, science fiction and modernist uh, uh, prop house, making props for all the big films. And he had a vacuform plastic guy and with a vacuform machine. So they made these for us. The guy that made them, Brett Scribner, he informed me that I was going to have to slant the sides or it would never pull off the mold. So that's why the Devo Red Hat has slightly beveled sides. He let me pick the bevel. That's how that happened. You know, and it's just, it's, it's stuff like that. It's all eclectic and, you know, far-reaching, bizarre leaps of faith. You know, it's hard to logically make sense out of some of this stuff because just some connection happens. You know, if you have a, quote, creative brain, you kind of keep all these things in mind that you've loved and that affected you in some way, meant something to you in some way, and you never forget them. And then sometimes you'll repurpose them. You'll change the meaning of them and and use them. And I think that's what good musicians do when they write original music. Let's talk about the album that's available. Jihad Jerry. Yeah, yeah, did really well at Record Store Day. They should have printed more. They sold out so quickly. Uh, but now it's available uh, as a CD. It's available streaming. Well, if you go to GeraldBCasali.com, you can buy seven inches of, of the single with two bonus tracks. And you can see the vi- video. And uh, and you these pins, see the JJ, the Jihad Jerry pin. And there's a crossword puzzle <laughs> and a poster. Yeah, there's good stuff. It's great to work with other creative people, you know, for so long when as Devo, we we never saw anything we liked. We did everything ourselves because we had to, because we were ahead of the curve and nobody was helping us get what we wanted to see. Uh, and and now that's not true. So much time has passed. This whole universe of people that have aesthetics that resonate with where we were at a long time ago, and they've even taken it further. Being part of the new wave movement, because these musical movements, they just don't happen anymore. No, they don't. In the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, I think probably the last real movement was grunge in Seattle. You were so different. You were so... um, It was performance art, too, like you say. It wasn't just music. I loved it. Just exciting, you know. I remember meeting... Heaven 17. And the human league. You know, it was Costello. It 
and David Byrne, the Talking Heads. Blondie. And remember going to see Suicide early on. And hanging out with Alan Vega one night and James Chance when he was doing Contort Yourself. Contort Yourself! Contort Yourself! It was just incredible because there was so much originality, so much diversity, so much energy, and people were... There was a, a music community hanging out, talking to each other. You felt like you knew these people all your life. There was something happening. There was a scene. And it was culturally, it gelled. And it's still when music hadn't been devalued. If you bought somebody's LP, because there still, still were LPs, although CDs were happy, starting to take over. The point was... There was a song sequence on there that the artist had carefully thought out. And if you liked the one song that you had heard on the radio or a jukebox, you're probably going to like four or five more off that same record because there was a body of work that was cohesive and thought out. That's not even true anymore. Most people think they should just have it free. And if there is a sound, the sound lasts about six months and then that's done. And it's throwaway. And, and you can't remember one from the other. It just sounds like a computer and two producers created all the music in a studio and then put some different people's voices on it. Which is why I think the music of the 60s, 70s, and 80s has lasted from 64 to 68, where the birds and all these guys who were pushing music to a new level, experimentation, Pet Sounds was coming out, and then Blonde on Blonde, and then Revolver, and the, it was this healthy competition. It wasn't this, I'm better than you. It was like, oh my gosh, did you just hear Pet Sounds? That was incredible. We got to do something just as good. That same kind of thing was there with New Wave. Was that happening in the late 70s yeah. where you would hear a record and it would excite you yeah. to write something else? I remember the big one was Pleasure Principle, Gary Newman. And then I met him at the Santa Monica, Santa Monica Civic in 1979 and saw his live show. And I was, I was humbled. I thought, oh, you think you've been coming up with great stuff and working hard. Well, you, you haven't started. And then, you know, I talked to him backstage and I was just so impressed and that did it. I don't think freedom of choice and that and the way that tour looked would have happened without me meeting him and trying to up our game because he definitely did that. And it's so sad that that's, that's just so gone because commercialism, marketing, and all that has taken over. The end all be all. It's everything. The evolution that you guys talked yeah. about at the very beginning. Yeah. Well, we were always satirizing marketing, but then you'd still get swallowed by it. Leave us a comment about Jerry Casale, Devo, and their music. What do you remember about that first Saturday Night Live performance? It blew me away. What other musical artists did you see on SNL that blew you away? Let us know in the comments. If you like this video, we do invite you to subscribe below. Make sure to click the bell so you never miss out. And make sure to check us out on Patreon as well as our new merch. Help us keep the music alive. So important. Till next time, three chords and the truth. Bye.